All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, let's listen to this gentleman. I've only listened to a little bit, so I'm going to keep an open mind on this, but uh, the little bit that I heard sounded very interesting. Here we go. Uh, and all the armies assembled were destroyed. So where did the nations come from? If there's another battle a thousand years later, where did they rise up from if they were destroyed in this chapter? Second question I have. How is there procreation if the next age doesn't allow marriage? And I'm taking this from what Jesus says in the Gospels when he says, in the next age, they are not given in marriage. Well, many people immediately jump to, well, what Jesus means by that is in heaven or the new heaven, new earth. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says the next age, next, immediately following the one we're in now. And many people call the next age the millennial reign. Well, here's the problem. How is there procreation among believers if there is not marriage? Because would that not be in and of itself sin? Then we see a third question. How do you explain the presence of sin and the rise against Christ after the reign if this is an everlasting kingdom which has already been abolished, which has already abolished the enemy, according to Old Testament prophecy. I want to jump back to Isaiah chapter 2 and show you something when it comes to Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah chapter 2, listen to these words in verse 4. Many call this, many people and scholars call this a, a millennial kingdom passage from the Old Testament. Okay, just, I got a I just got to comment on this this uh, idea of scholars. Um, there are not these glorified men that have more knowledge than you and me. Okay? There's not secret, special knowledge given to certain men that we have to lean upon. We have everything directly from God in the King James Bible. The Old Testament. And they do a lot of spiritual or scriptural gymnastics when it comes to this. Well, here's what he says. In chapter 2, verse 4, And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. Now, what Scripture tells us, if this is a millennial kingdom passage and there is a thousand year reign and then another battle, this passage says there will never be a war after that thousand year period. So it doesn't fit that timeline. How can nations do that? Look at chapter 4 of Isaiah, verse 1. It says, For seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. In that day, okay. the branch of the yeah, Lord. Yeah, so Jesus, this guy, I like this guy. He's moving. He's using scripture. I like that. I like that. I like people that use that actually use scripture. It's unbelievable. It's incredible how many people talk about this or whatever, and they just they just talk philosophy and vain ramblings, and they don't actually go to the Word of God. They don't actually go to their Bible. In Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now, how, what, is, what else is he? Hold on a second. I'm Jesus. Little, will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel it will come about that I, I'm called sorry by about your name this. take away our reproach in that day the branch of the Lord Jesus will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create 
Over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies, a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a canopy. There will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. See, Matt, okay, what, what do you mean? What's going on there? It means that there will never, ever be any sin or wretchedness or, or, or wickedness at all again. There will not be another war. But in order to make oh, a pre- uh oh, uh oh, you gotta get your head out of your butt. Your, well, anytime I hear butt, I'm thinking somebody's got their head in their butt. Mill view fit, or the word fit with a pre mill mill view. You have to have sin that rises up and another battle. Scripture says that won't take place after Christ is reigning. So, that's Isaiah. But All right, then, so we can do away with pre-mill. So why talk about it? Why bring it up? Again, another question I have. Simply asking a question for you to think about. I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm saying you be a Berean and use... Why don't you have the answers? That's another thing that astonishes me. Say, so, oh, we can't know the truth. Well, Jesus is the truth. You don't know Jesus? I mean, really. If you say you can't know the truth, you're on the wrong side of the fence, Jack. And uh, John 8, verse 32, And ye shall know the truth. Right there. What more do you need? And the truth shall make you free. And ye shall know the truth. So you can know the truth. So you're lying. when the, If you say you can't know the truth, then you're on the wrong side. By your own words. I'm not condemning you. You've condemned yourself. John 14, verse 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive... Because it sees him not, neither knows him, but, huh? But ye know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. When you're born of God, the Spirit of truth is in you, and ye shall know the truth. Scripture in light of Scripture. Here's one of the most important questions I have. According to most pre-mill individuals that take Old Testament passages and try to make it about the thousand year period, there will be animal sacrifice. But why? During a thousand year period after death, burial, resurrection of Jesus uh, that's Christ. A, you know, that's a great point. These people... Uh, they're so ridiculous. I mean, just beyond ridiculous, really. But what they're going to say, or what they say, is that Jesus comes and then goes to the Middle East, and then they have a return to animal sacrifices. All right? And they get this from uh, complete lack of understanding. And I just wonder sometimes, have these guys even read the Bible? It's amazing, really. Let's go to Hebrews 10. Let's go to... Uh, I think it's Hebrews 10, isn't it? Am I way off here? Let's see how far off I am. Yeah, Hebrews 10, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So why? Why would it make any sense? Do you think, okay, now all of a sudden, Jesus laying down his life, not just for your sins, but for the sins of the whole world, you, now that doesn't matter. Is that what you believe? Is that what you're teaching? All of a sudden, that sacrifice doesn't mean squat. Jesus died in vain. Now we got to go back to sacrificing animals. 
to appease God, even though it never did appease God. It never took away sins. It never took away sins before, and then now all of a sudden it will. This is delusional. These people are delusional, and they deserve to believe a lie. They do. They don't deserve to know the truth because they don't believe the truth. They don't believe God. And they, they're fooled. They're deceived. Why would you listen to them? Why would you trust in men that don't believe the Word of God, that don't believe the Bible that they hold in their hands? Why would you do that? Why, why not just believe what the Bible says? Is that too crazy? Christ, return of Christ, battle of Armageddon, and the establishment of a thousand year period? Why would God reinstitute animal sacrifice even for the sins of Jesus during this time if Christ was the ultimate sacrifice and fulfillment of the law? You may be saying, whoa, whoa time out, man. Hold on. Even for Jesus? Well, when we try to make... Yeah, okay, let me make his point. I'm not sure what he's going to say here. Let me see if I can find a verse to make it simple. Oh, oh, that's the wrong wording, isn't it? That's the wrong wording. Who became? Oh, let's see. Who knew no sin? Who knew it? For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. See, he was made to be sin. Jesus was made to be sin even though he didn't know sin. So he was made to be sin and sacrificed offered to God for our sins that we might be made the righteousness of God in him all right so that, that's a good that's a good point that he's making here if he's if you don't scramble this too much you're fit that's what it has to be let me take you to Ezekiel the, the book of Ezekiel tells us that there is a time period, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 shows Gog and Magog. And many people view that passage as this battle of Armageddon. And then they see chapter 40 with the establishment of... Or the Alright, so just in case somebody might not understand. The Gog and Magog that we read about here in Revelation 20 is a reflection, if you will, of what we read in Ezekiel 38, 39. Okay, this is something that took place, and then, therefore, this battle spoken of is um, sort of a, you know, what I, what I call a reflection. Uh, is that a good word, good term? It's something that's already taking place, and it's not... <laughs> an actual battle okay I mean it is and it isn't right what's gonna happen and what we read it all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation first of all in Genesis 3 verse 15 the Lord said to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed this shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel God is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. Okay, so this so-called battle is not really a battle. I mean, if you want to say the serpent, he's going to bruise the Lord's heel. That's part of his, part of the battle. Okay, all right, but it's not really a battle. 
because the enemy is going to get their donkey kicked, if you will. All right? They're going to get their rear ends beat severely. All right? this, is, it, this is not a matter of you know, a struggle. This ain't no struggle at all. This is going to be God destroying, devouring the enemy forever. It's not even going to be close. It's not going to be, they're not going to be fighting back. They're going to be cowering in fear. That's the battle. All right. It's not really a battle. For the return of Israel to safety and the next eight chapters, 40 or nine chapters, 41 through 48, the next uh, ending of Ezekiel, many people call this the millennial kingdom. Never says millennial kingdom, but they try to make it fit with their own perspective. Well, here's what takes place. If this is the millennial kingdom, a literal thousand year period after Jesus returns, here's a description that we find in chapter 43, verse 25. 4325 4325 oh yeah 4325 7 days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering they shall also prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish is that what you're quoting? Five. For seven days you shall prepare daily a goat for a sin offering. Also a young bull and a ram. Alright, so this is a good point. So he's saying that if Jesus returns and then there's a thousand years and they're offering sin offerings, then that means that they're sin. <laughs> so when Jesus comes, it's not the great and terrible day of the Lord, as we read in Isaiah. It was so great and terrible. If things continue, oh, was it Joel or Isaiah? I'm sorry, Joel. That's in Joel. I pardon. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. Oh, now right there. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? This is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Well, what's so great and terrible about it if sin continues? See, I, I just don't think people are putting any thought into this at all. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, that's the day of resurrection, right? For example, 1 Corinthians 15 makes it as easy as possible in my opinion to to understand for as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order Christ the first root afterward they that are Christ at his coming when he comes in the clouds of heaven that's the day of resurrection all right so when that day of resurrection happens when we that when we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye when we take off incorruption and put on, I'm sorry, when we take off corruption and put on incorruption, when we take off mortality and put on immortality, right? That's the resurrection. That's when he comes in the clouds of heaven. Right? When that happens, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's it. There's no more death. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord 
Jesus Christ. See, there's no more death, no more sin. There's no more death because there's no more sin. You can't have sin, but no more death. The sting of death is sin. You, you can't have, you just can't have death. You, I'm sorry, you can't have sin and no more death. It, it, it's illogical. It's an impossibility. Because there's sin, there's death. Alright? If you take away death, you've taken away sin All right. it's pretty that's pretty simple eh? <laughs> there's no way around it man there is no way around it so why would you be offering sacrifices for sin if there is no more sin and when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we are resurrected judgment day and there will be no more sin after the judgment which happens on his return the judgment is are you saved or are you not saved there is no other judgment that's it when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is judgment day the great and terrible day of the Lord it's what's prophesied all throughout the Bible how do you miss it down from the flock without blemish shall be prepared for seven days they shall make an atonement now pause for just a moment again wait the book of Hebrews says that a, a bull a goat a ram a lamb should never be sacrificed again because atonement has already been made in Jesus Christ but now there is a thousand year period where Jesus is reigning and we're offering the blood of bulls and rams and goats and lambs for atonement. They're, we're offering their blood because Jesus' blood is not good enough? That's a question I simply have. <laughs> but you know the hard. answer to it, dummy. Why would you pretend like you don't know? I don't know. Just question our hair. What are you waiting on, buddy? You know. You already know. It says in chapter 44, listen to this. As, verse 3, As for the prince, he shall sit in it as prince to eat bread before... Well, oh, what's he talking about? For, uh, I'm so, I wasn't paying attention. I'm sorry. What do you say? Chapter 44, verse 3. It is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the same way. By the way of the same, excuse me. Before the Lord, he shall enter by way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the same way. Now I have asked many times, who is the prince? Who is the ruler? singular prince. In fact, when you read Ezekiel, you find out God had a tough time with the princes or shepherds of that day. He said, there is coming a prince who will lead my people and he will not be like the former princes. Well, in the thousand year reign, who is reigning? Jesus Christ. And if this is the case, he should be the prince, correct? Yeah, that's you got it. You got it, kiddo. You got it right. And let's use another example. Um, that I like to use. Another example of Jesus being referred to as the Prince. Alright. In Daniel chapter 9, in the 70 weeks, and uh, 70 weeks shall be determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy and that that's obviously speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ 
Then we read here in verse 25 to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Messiah the Prince. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He has destroyed the temple and then rebuilt the temple and ascended to heaven where in his father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, return, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. It's Jesus, right? And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. He shall lay down his life, not for himself, though, but for the whole world. And the people of the prince, which now is in reference to the Jews, that shall come destroy the city, they shall be the one that has him killed. Right? And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. The end of the war, of course, is the end of the world. Because right, that's when the war is going to be over. Right? God's going to put an end once and for all. At the end of the world, when he comes in the clouds of heaven and lifts us up out of this world and sends fire down upon the whole earth. And there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And then we'll be, we will be set back down. And, excuse me, and of course here, uh, um, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. The consummation is the end of the war. It's the marriage between us, or I'm sorry, how do I say this? The body of Christ and the Lord Jesus. When we come together as one in our glorified bodies. Correct. I'm just asking, but notice what the prince has to do. Look at chapter 46, verse 1. Thus says the Lord God, The gate of the inner court facing east shall be shut six working days, but it shall be opened on the Sabbath day and opened on the day of the new moon. The prince shall enter by way of the porch of the gate from outside and stand by the post of the gate. Then the priest shall provide this burnt offering and his peace offering. And he shall worship at the threshold of the gate, and then go out, but the gate shall not be shut until evening. Verse 4. The burnt offering which the prince shall offer to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish, and a ram without blemish. If I'm reading that correctly, and that, to many people, is a an Old Testament reference to the Millennial Kingdom, uh, it's Old Testament. It's not a reference to the Millennial Kingdom at all. And you're right to make this point. Then what you have is a ruler, who we would assume might be Jesus Christ, offering a burnt offering and or a sin offering to the Lord, and those are offered on account of your own personal sin. Jesus Christ never has to offer any personal sacrifice for his own sin. He is the sacrifice for our sin. Yep. All right. Good point. It's a good good job out of him. I'm not sure where he's going with all this, but uh, obviously he he gets it. The idea of a future millennial reign is nuts. So it, it's nuts. Uh, these people are out of their minds, and you know you, people probably wonder. Why I, I think they're not saved. How could you be that blind? It, it, that's I, I can't help but think. How could somebody be that blind? I get it. If you're a new believer and you're still learning, I get it. But if you got the audacity to stand behind a pulpit and or and or to make a uh, put your face or, or just even just to make a video you don't even have to show your face I don't but just to preach to another person just to express your thoughts and ideas to another person 
But how do you do that? And when you don't have any understanding whatsoever. How do you do that without fear? How do you preach falsely? Well, I know what's going on. I already know what's going on. They are taking what they learned in the public public school system. Okay, so in the public school system, they sit in class and they they listen to the teacher. And then they echo what the teacher says, irregardless of understanding. They don't need to understand nothing. All they have to do is memorize what the teacher said. All right. And now translate that into the churches behind the pulpits. These people are not understanding what they're parroting. They heard a teacher say something and now they've memorized it and they stand behind the pulpit and they parrot what they've heard without any understanding at all. And it's gotten worse and worse to a point to it's never been this worse. It's never been this bad. There's very few people that have any understanding at all. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. Because we literally have the written word of God. You think about what we read in Exodus. How the, the tables of stone were written with the finger of God. And then you think about Jesus says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know the power of the Word of God, right? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And you got that memorized, right? Because you heard a teacher say it. But do you understand it? I think if you understood it, you would understand that you we have to have the Word of God. We do have the Word of God directly from God. Directly from God. It's not from man. This ain't a Harry Potter book. These are not dead words. These are words of life. So why don't you believe it? It's going to play out, man. It's going to play out. Just as the Bible says. It's incredible. Why do you have doubt? The Word of God comes from heaven. The words that are in your hand are from God. 